uh, dyslexia, dyslexia, dyslexia. What a horrible way to spell the name of a group of literacy, literacy handicaps. Dyslexia affects an estimated 15 to 20% of the population, formatting to enhance the enjoyability of reading for this aud audience and writing from the perspective of dyslexic authors. Is it all bad or are there hidden co um, compensations? So that's, uh, that's the start. And as I was saying before, I was, we were rudely interrupted. Cloning freedom and freedom's law, uh, that never works. <laughs> I feel like Bullwinkle. Uh, um, are the dyslexia friendly books through brain lag. And uh, they're also just rollick of good reads. And they have a regular edition, which is a little cheaper because doing the dyslexia, it's a larger book and there's just no way around it. It's going to cost more. So we may as well start with what is dyslexia? And uh, from my perspective, a pain in the backside. <laughs> I am dyslectic, obviously, uh, but um, not one thing. Reversal problems, sticking on first spelling form, alternative learning methods, tactile learning from forms that affect math. Uh, and I'll just toss it out and uh, Catherine, can you give us a bit of input? So uh, I'm, I'm not dyslexic. So uh, most of my knowledge has come from uh, primarily Stephen. Uh, I know Hugh is uh, also dyslexic, although I, I didn't realize that till uh, several years after I started publishing his books, but um, yeah, with Stephen's help, I uh, did some research and put together a dyslexic formatted edition of the so far two books of Stephen's space opera series, Cloning Freedom and Freedom's Law. And I just basically used best practices from what I could find, which was uh, increased spacing between the characters and the lines in the paragraph, sans serif text, which uh, I ended up using in the standard edition as well. Um, the big ones seem to be left aligned text, not justified, as well as uh, italics seem to be harder for people with dyslexia, many people with dyslexia to read. So I used bold text instead of italics for emphasis, uh, unspoken character dialogue, ship names, things like that. Yeah, uh, it reads like silk. Uh, Hugh, do you have anything you want to toss in on, toss on the fire? Uh, you're muted. You're muted. <clears throat> Sorry about that. <laughs> I, I misread the menu. It was on screen. No. <laughs> um, no, I was sort of, a, you know, the dyslexia has been sort of a, uh, a, 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 a sort of a, a well-kept secret in my, my part, although anyone who's looked at my manuscripts in my workshop is always, although uh, I was probably suspected something was up. Although again, um, what I found is that uh, it's amazing how many people just say, well, that is just an excuse for laziness and inattentiveness. And uh, they have uh, no idea of the, the frustration about it all. And, and actually what I found is some of the uh, uh, responses you get is, you know, to, to, to just concentrate harder, or try harder, actually in my case makes it worse. Uh, so if you add stress and it, comes, and it works with both numeric characters, so I actually process math a lot slower. 
uh, then uh, I, I, I certainly people without that condition. And also, uh, um, uh, you know, just it, the reversals get worse if I mean, God help you if I'm having trouble in traffic. Uh, sometimes I won't even drive uh, because of the road signs and things like that. So it's it can get get pretty hairy sometimes, but it's something that I've sort of learned to compensate with and uh, and, and and work with. So the uh, uh, I, I had no idea there was a dyslexic condition of anything, and so I'm really I want to know <laughs> where I can get more of these. I, I do find that sometimes large format type for uh, the, the the vision impaired helps me a lot because they use some of the same principles, particularly the, uh, the larger type and the sans serif types, you know, because you can find fixed points on the, the type, the letters that, are, you know, sort of keep you from reversing them so much. So it's, uh, uh, it, it, it's very helpful in that regard. But it is, um, uh, I actually think it does sort of put you a bit on the margins in a lot of ways, because when I was, when it was first discussed in my case, I was 10. And this is like 1967, and this was sort of like at the the point where a lot of teachers and uh, and uh, people uh, people I was dealing with, caregivers and stuff, were sort of uh, had you on the uh, 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 what you would call serious cognitive impairment, what we would call mentally retarded back then, mm -hmm. and uh, and and so you were just sort of going to be stuck in the dumb class and whatever whatever that happened was because of the dyslexia again it was interesting because even so i could still read it at a very high level and my comprehension was good but spelling oh it's quite interesting and again because they assumed you could read well that uh that uh, you were just being lazy in your spelling and so uh a very much sort of a victorian era attitude emerges about these things it's just like a try harder so it's very frustrating, but you're on the margins with dyslexia because you're neurologically atypical in another way. And uh, I, I think as we were talking about with the panel of the, I like the ecotomes, symbolic ecotomes for science fiction. Uh, you uh, sometimes look at the world in, in odd ways. You mentioned earlier, um, is there a, are there advantages? One, one I found is that one, science fiction sounding names <laughs> Can sometimes be have sometimes been the product of uh, my uh, uh, my dyslexia, and it's sometimes a reversal of words. And I remember that in one of my stories, I think it was the Zedberger simulations. I uh, um, I have an institution called the International Church of Business, and that's me misreading. A, uh, a, there was a sign that was about the International School of Business. For some reason, I would always read it as, and I swear I thought it was the International Church of Business until my wife who was standing next to me one day said, no, that's cool. And so she, uh, uh, I uh, wrote it down and ended up using it. So I, I, I thanked my odd condition or my odd way of pre, uh, processing the universe for that. Yeah. Uh, we have a question of, in the, uh in the chat, I have, have you, well, it says, have you heard, but have you heard of a proper dyslexia font? Uh, and I'm replying, I've seen a font supposedly misspelled, designed for dyslexia and found it practically, and again, misspelled, unreadable. Uh, mm. And we had this in the early days of looking over the edition, you sent me a, a copy of it. And uh, I, it was just the weirdest thing, weirdest thing yeah. I'd ever seen. Now, the interesting thing that happens with an adult dyslexic, you've set, spent so much time learning to cope, and I'm sure you, under, you have too, Hugh, that it's really hard to see what's coming from the condition and what's coming from the coping mechanisms that you've developed. And you get oh, yeah. used to these mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, can, I can make a comment about the typefaces. Um, when I was looking through those for my kids who were just learning uh, to read, I asked the head of Adobe uh, uh, type uh, design uh, whether they were any good. And he said, yeah, they'd actually done a lot of lab testing. And what it turned out is... Um, there was absolutely no difference um, 
in, in terms of the readability that it was you know, basically fraudulent. However, uh, what I discovered personally is when I uh, sent my kids to school with this typeface, which to them was no easier to read than any other, uh, because it was completely incomprehensible to the teachers um, and my kid would read it, they thought, oh, maybe there, there is something here. So in terms of you know, propagandizing, <laughs> getting across <laughs> the teachers that this was a real condition, um, then yeah, that, that was helpful. But in terms of actually reading it, now there's one new one since then, uh, which I don't know about. So, uh, and that's one you had to pay for. So I, I, I don't wanna trash talk uh, the commercial one, which might in fact have some basis, uh, weighting the bottom of the text a little more uh, space and differently and so on. But uh, when you're talking about um, history of dyslexia, one of the things I'd like to mention is that it's not just about reading, uh, that it's a whole uh, family of disabilities. So um, my biggest problem was with spelling. And uh, because I didn't have that diagnosis as a kid, I just had to brute force learn how to, you know, basically what I learned is ideograms rather than, than real spelling. And uh, it, you know, meant all my childhood summers were spent on that, but brute forced it through. But uh, that's only one of the uh, characteristics. So calendars don't make sense to a lot of dyslexics. Um, airplane, I, airplane itineraries. Airplane itineraries. Oh, any, God. <laughs> any kind of calendar or schedule, right? That mm -hmm. my, my kids were, you know, in high school before they could tell me what the months of the year were or the days of the week. Um, any, any kind of math is confusing. Um, all right, it's a whole separate uh, category, right? Spreadsheets. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's not... Just the reading, though, that's the most obvious one because our, our um, universe is so heavily text-based, right? But it's a whole category. And then sometimes people say, oh, well, you can't be dyslexic because you do X well. You know, you can read perfectly well. Well, you know, I was reading at a university level in grade six, mm -hmm. uh, which confused my teacher. And he thought I must be plagiarizing since I was, you know, in the low reading group. And it was only through the provincial testing that he realized I was reading at you know grade 13 level and that when he sat me down and sort of watched me he realized I was in the lowest reading group but I could tell him everything about the stories in the high reading group because they were way more interesting than the ones in the low reading group mm -hmm. and so um, those kind of experiences but uh, one of the things you know sort of more recently I realized is that organizational um, principles of text, like introduction, middle and end, all of those basic structure things uh, are more difficult for many dyslexics. So it's suggested one reason I've ended up as a developmental editor is I had to kind of explicitly teach myself those rules and became so good at it that now you know, I'm a structural editor. So, um, in compensating for that disability, I became more conscious of those principles and maybe therefore do them better. One but, of those, go ahead. Yeah. Sorry, Robert, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, I'm still going. I go on forever. Go ahead. Uh, what I was saying is that one thing you really sort of make an important point, and I've noticed this with other dyslexics, is that we all have different uh, coping or uh, cognitive uh, balancing strategies in a way. And so like I have one friend I worked with who he could barely compose a sentence. The monkeys could write sentences better than this poor guy, and, but he was brilliant, you know, you know, really, you know, and incredible organizational skills. And he discovered Excel. And for some reason, the being able to set things out in these little colored uh, squares in Excel, he was, you know, able to manage, you know, and actually even could, in a sense, write text in Excel, you know, in the boxes. And they would actually, you know, if you could transcribe those sentences, they were pretty good. And uh, at one time, I remember I was sitting in an airport with him 
And he had this little notebook, he also had a little notebook to doodle things in it. I realized, I said, you know, his name was Robert too. And I said, Robert, Bob, are you, are you making a manual Excel chart? <laughs> and he said, yeah, I'm just planning the week. <laughs> you know, so it, it's very true. And, and my own way is that I actually write in a very oral way. I'm speaking the words as I type them. And I think Catherine probably picked this up editing me a lot is that because a lot of the times I get homonyms and synonyms all mixed up because I'm saying them, but the, uh, and that's a problem with pure you know, text, but actually in some ways, because I also like to write for radio, a real advantage. <laughs> so I can yeah. where I sort of dive into that medium probably with uh, quite, quite effectively. And because I'm always hearing it already. So it's, there's a lot of different ways of coping. Yeah, when you're talking and, and, about and it's very true that everybody, I think every case is different and dyslexia yeah. is really this huge blanket term that gets thrown over a whole bunch of different handicaps and everybody has to find their own, their own way. I've kind of prefer neurologically atypical. <laughs> to handicap myself you know because i like to think i'm just original my brain is, <laughs> is original <laughs> to right down to the way it works it does seem to be research to support to the greater creativity you, you know, have to because you have to solve more problems <laughs> not to get my life well, also <laughs> i i heard one theory that um, that in a dyslectic brain the lobes don't specialize. So each lobe keeps doing everything. And then when they try to cross communicate, you get glitches. And that's where, you know, that's one thing that I've heard as an explanation of how it's working neurologically. So I like to say that the first space shuttle was dyslectic because <laughs> They had had five computers, four of them were all going on one stream, and the other one was a half second out or something, and it delayed the launch on a couple of occasions. So I was going to follow up. I'll just make a quick example of uh, people adapting to it. One of my friends, one of my more genius friends, uh, also I think he, he would be a brilliant writer if he hadn't been dyslexic. Uh, found he couldn't write in English. The letters were just too confusing for him. So he developed his own uh, alphabet that was completely symmetrical. There was no writer left to it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, though he, and he taught himself to write in his own way. So I, I can't read it, you can't read it, but he could read it and write notes to himself and, and write letters. And you know, just the extremes to which people are prepared to go to try so to... So do you think maybe that was how written language was invented? <laughs> Somebody just to, to, just to cope, sort of created his own symbols and other people picked them up? <laughs> you know? Could be, yeah. Could be. I will say Sorry it's there. easier to learn the Norse runes than it was to learn English. Yeah. I, I, I can write in both. Well, print in both. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> Well, As an outsider, I uh, am finding it very enlightening and very interesting hearing about uh, all these struggles. And it's true. I don't hear a lot about dyslexia in popular culture or, you know, uh, social media or anything. And especially considering the rise in understanding of uh, other other things like uh, ADHD and autism and such, you know, there's so much increased understanding about uh, people with those uh, conditions. And there's yet to be that kind of awakening for dyslexia. And from the sounds of it, there's uh, a similar number of people who live with dyslexia as with uh, other uh, neuroatypical you know, conditions. I think like with a lot of handicaps, at a very young age, you're taught to be ashamed of it. Uh, you're lazy, you're stupid, you can't be bothered. Um, 
And it's because the school system wants to teach in a very narrow format. We already know that there are three major learning modalities, and each one has a subdivision that breaks it more or less in two. And one does something like 48% of the population, one does about 50% of the population, the other does 2% of the population. Uh, but the school system keeps fanatically sticking to the modality that only works for one and then moving on to the next as the next theory comes out and they cycle through them. And they've done this a couple of times in my lifetime. Yeah, I have so, a couple of quick anecdotes about that when uh, my daughter uh, was dyslexic and she happened to get a teacher who was uh, excellent. He just graduated from a master's in neurodivergency. So actually knew what the hell he was doing. So he asked if he could have $150 from the school board to um, put some dyslexic software onto the school computers for my daughter. And the head of uh, special services, oh, well, we couldn't possibly do that because there's, uh, with only the one person in the entire school system was dyslexia. He says, what the hell are you talking about? It's the single most common handicap out there, it's 10 to 15% of the school population. And she said, well, no, that, that can't be right. I, I haven't really heard of it. Now she was, her expertise was autism. So she was, you know, really big on getting resources for autistic kids, but dyslexic, you know, that just wasn't it. And then my daughter had another teacher who was so awful. We uh, ultimately pulled her out of the classroom, out of the school. She's laughing in the corner. Um, <laughs> because his entire teaching method was to have them read the textbook and fill in the blanks on uh, his word sheets, right? So he'd have a worksheet, they would read the textbook, they would find the word in the textbook and then write it into the blank. And I said, you understand my daughter's dyslexic, she's copying this letter by letter. Can you tell me the educational um, objective of having her read through all of this text word by word to find a word to copy letter by letter into the blank. How does that relate to social studies in any way, shape or form? And he, his response to me was, well, what else can I do? That like, how else could I teach her? And if oh any God. of my student teachers had ever said that to me, I would have failed them on the spot mm -hmm. <laughs> because you know, we teach you 103 different methods of teaching and the principle is, if this isn't getting through to a kid, try one of the other 150. But it was too much effort for him uh, to help my kid. And it was easier just to yell at her for being lazy and stupid. Well, fuck that. Well, lazy was a factor in the dyslexia, but I think it was in some uh, the locus of the laziness was somewhere else than your daughter. <laughs> no. So uh, Nicole Wilson here has uh, had her hand up for a while. Shall we uh, let her ask her question or offer her comment? Sure. Nicole? Ju uh, just unmute yourself. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Sorry, a little slow to find it. Um, I have, I'm dyslexic, uh, among other neurological problems. But uh, what I have found interesting is that Although it was difficult to learn to learn when I got there, it meant that I'm more flexible than some other people. Mm -hmm. So uh, sometimes I don't have the use of the right side of my body. So I've learned to write left handed. When I couldn't use a whiteboard, I learned to write upside down in my office to talk to students. And I'm wondering, is that a common experience? Anyone else kind of had to work around extra challenges or um, what's your coping problem? mechanisms? Yeah, exactly. I, uh... I read at about a quarter to half the speed of a person with my equivalent level of education, university. However, I retain about four times the amount of what I read. And that's how I managed to get through university because what people were reading four or five times, I was reading once, and I was able to hang on to it. Um, part of what, how things manifest with me, whether it's the dyslexia or just something else, I, I got hit in the head one too many times as a child, which also happened. Uh, 
But um, I have a absolutely abysmal, abysmal medium-term memory. Consequently, my long-term memory has had to develop and kick into a very high level. And I can still quote my high school Shakespeare from memory because I couldn't put it in the intermediate term memory, which is what holds it long enough for you to write the test and move on. I had to put it in the long term. And so it's coping mechanisms. You have to survive, so you just learn to cope. At least that's, you know, how I see it. Uh, anyone else? <laughs> yeah, those of us who were ultimately successful found ways around it. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, you know, I probably have it slightly um, less awful and do my brothers uh, my, and, and my daughters. I also had the advantage that as I was growing up, um, word processing came into play. And I thought I was getting better, but really, as my wife pointed out to me, it was autocorrect. Uh, <laughs> but, <Yes>. um, <laughs> you know, you, you do always have to come up with those coping mechanisms, but sometimes um, it's also an advantage. So uh, my daughters had trouble reading. Um, they particularly did not like reading out to the class because uh, that's difficult, right? And then... Uh, becomes the focus of criticism by your peers. But what my daughters discovered is because they can read as easily upside down as upside up, they would turn the book upside down and read it. And that would amaze their teachers and the fellow students and they'd shut up about it, right? So uh, <laughs> sometimes it's not about you coping so much as, as getting your, uh, peers and superiors. Are, are they involved working in architecture or engineering? Because the ability to read blueprints that the client's <laughs> looking at <laughs> upside down is extremely valuable. <laughs> yeah, no, no. My daughter, uh, older one is a biostatistician and the other one's just entering college. Now the younger one, we were prepared for her to be dyslexic because the older one was diagnosed. Uh, we had a very alert grade three teacher who said there's something going on here that's not normal. And in her getting diagnosed, I got my diagnosis. <laughs> um, I turned out to be dyslexic because when the doctor asked who is the parent that had dyslexia, everyone in the room looked at me. And that was the first I knew about it. But um, I lost my train of thought. Uh, another sign of... <laughs> What was I talking about? I was going somewhere with that. Your daughter, your youngest daughter. Right, right. She had the additional problem of a vision issue mm. uh, where her eyes don't track uh, together. So whenever she read, she had a stutter because she, you know, she'd say the, the duck, but because her eyes went to the, the three times, as far as she was concerned, she was reading in a line, whatever her eyes showed her. Mm -hmm. And so it took us a long time. And my frustration was that we took her to the eye doctor three times and three times she said, there's nothing wrong with her eyes. And then she was away or sick or something. So we took her to another doctor and they said, well, what are you doing about the fact her eyes can't track? Doesn't she have trouble reading? And um, so, you know, then once we knew what both problems were, we could start to address them, but it's still hard for her to read. Mm -hmm. And the tracking issue she solved because phones if you read on your phone, the line is so short, she can take it in in one go. So she reads a novel a day on her phone, but now she's entering college and is going to have to read textbooks. We're not sure how that's going to, how well that's going to go, but mm -hmm. you find ways, right? Yeah. Well, one thing I picked up when I started I was an undergrad is, and I was interested in your, Robert, on your comment about learning to read bar and write through ideograms. Um, because I used to do a lot of illustration work when I was in high school and all that, and I used these repeatograph pens, and uh, and that's what I, what I made art with. I made comic books and posters and things, and and aspiring heavy metal covers, you know, <laughs> sort of things you do when you're a teenager. And uh, uh, and then uh, what happened is that I discovered that when I was in lectures at university, is that I can make notes fairly quickly, 
But just when I wrote them down as words that the professor or the instructor would say, I couldn't retain them very well. But if I went, took those same lecture notes at the end of the day, went home, took out my repeatograph pens and copied them out nicely as though the, the words were a work of art or like pictures, I could remember them. And it was, uh, I remember actually using that method in uh, Brian Kolb, as you may, I don't know if you ever met him and talked brain function with him at U of L, Robert. Uh, I took his course in brain and behavior and psychology. I got 100% my final because <laughs> I did it all that way. I, drew, I, I even did an extra diagram in the exam because that's how I remembered the, the different, um, I don't remember them now, but the different areas of, uh, of different functions, slightly localized because he didn't believe in hard localization of the brain either. Um, but it, yeah, so if you yeah, turn maybe, it into a picture. Maybe a memory is part of the syndrome, right? Both yeah. two thirds of us don't have medium memory. Mm -hmm. yeah, and um, that was a way of getting through sort of short circuiting the medium memory and going yeah. into long term memory. So it's very helpful. Yeah. And I just want to get something out as a uh, tip for anybody who might be working with a dyslectic or is dyslectic. Never rush when spelling a new word. One of the worst things that you can do is have kids taking notes in class because they're rushing to get it down. The teacher is lecturing, they're talking <clears throat> and they don't have time to pause and get it down properly. Do how to spell the words first, then do the lecture. And this is how you work around the problems in the brain. This is how you work with the brain to give people the tools that, that they need. Because once that first spelling gets in, it's <laughs> stuck. And you need dynamite to shift it. My problem is I say to myself, it's not the way you think is it, it's the other way. And then I learned that way. But now I don't, I, I think the rule was it's not spelled the way you think it is. So even though I've corrected it, I go back to the wrong way. So mm -hmm. my mom used to say, one of the main reasons that one of my main coping strategies as a young person is that my mother actually didn't believe that uh, I was lazy or, or, or stupid. Uh, and so she did understand that I actually could write quite well. And she, she helped me a lot with the preparation of my essays and my, you know, uh, and that really helped me a lot, you know, and, um, and by the time I, you know, was over at graduate school, I had a lot of the things I picked up from her. She was a university secretary. Um, she really, I had some of the skills that she used as a secretary, as a typist, that were also very helpful. Robert, I see mentioned that um, word processing saved my life. And it wasn't just autocorrect. It was also that um, I just started when in sort of my working life, when uh, word processing was becoming a big deal. And I just found that, again, I could do something similar to my old note-taking and sort of turning it into more of a graphic uh, experience, the, uh, the, the, the textual material I had to deal with. And that really helps for me anyway. So I embraced that technology very quickly when it came out in the 80s. But, uh, yeah, I got oh, through, yes. I oh, got through oh. university because my mom brought me a correcting selectric. So when I made a mistake, I could usually tell if a word was misspelled, but only after I typed it, which before when a manual typewriter meant I had to retype the whole page or, or oh, get my mom yeah. to type it. Yeah. So when I had a yeah. correcting selectric, that my, my world blossomed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I remember 1982, I was in, in London and there was a radio shacks were called Tandys back in, in the UK. And my dad who lived there, I was visiting him, it was 1982. And, we're walking out of this Tandy shop near his, his place. And we saw this self-correcting typewriter, you know, with the little window that did the stuff. And we, and we just both said, we got to get this. <laughs> we have got to get this thing. So, so he had one. He got one right away because he had a lot more money than me. Uh, but that didn't last long. He got, a, he, got a, he got a PC as quickly as he could. And uh, that made all the difference. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. My first... Uh... My first uh, word processor was paperclip. 
and it was revolutionary. And now the modern ones, one of the greatest advances in word processors that have happened is that now it puts up the word suggestions and it gives pseudonyms for them off to the side. This is the new, the new version of Word because mm -hmm. I could get all the suggestions for the possible spellings of a word and I couldn't recognize which one was right. But having, you know, bare, ruminant beside it, mammal. All right, now I know it's, this is the bear that I want, as opposed to bear, naked. Uh, it's a great improvement. Mm. We have a uh, nice question in the chat, uh, again, from Nicole Wilson. Uh, she asked, do any of you have words you cannot recall or cannot recall how to say? I know, Stephen, you uh, answered that in the chat, but uh, Hugh and Robert, if you have anything to add to that. Oh, yeah. I just can't think of them right now. <laughs> uh, and I don't know if it's a question of dyslexia or just I'm I'm aging fast. <laughs> Dementia yeah. can also be the answer. <laughs> in, in my case, I'm losing proper nouns, although it's more indicative of my being in my 70s than it does in uh, terms of uh, dyslexia. I never used to have that problem. But uh, again, this is a constellation of disabilities that go under that label. So there is a percentage of dyslexics for whom that is a, a real thing. Yeah. I noticed that P. Farrell saying in the chat that his word recall gets worse when he's tired and that. Yeah, and, and same thing with me and just in general, a reversal of uh, my spelling goes all to hell when I'm tired mm -hmm. or stressed. It's uh, pretty bad. So. Yeah, I've had uh, some ongoing fatigue over the past couple of years and uh, I, my word recall is worse. Uh, a number of other things, but also my short-term memory is shot anymore. I mean, I'm sure everybody has the experience of uh, looking at your phone three times and still having no idea what time it is. But, uh, you know, I, I think, okay, I need to do this thing next. And it's just immediately gone from my mind. And yeah. this is something that, yeah. you know, I've been struggling with because of, I'm tired all the time. Oh, I know. I, I've I've lost. I mean, I've I, I really need a, a human personal assistant to remember things like appointments, <laughs> bus routes that I mean. I mean, I've almost I've dashed out of the house to get someplace, and I've completely forgotten the the transit route I'm supposed to take. Yeah, <laughs> and it's and I don't know if that's. Uh, an artifact of my dyslexia. I was all about word recall. I wanted to mention my sister sometimes blanks for proper nouns, and she has a a, a default word flipper. You know, so she says, "Hand me the the, the, the flipper, flipper." You know, we already lost. We lost the the flipper. <laughs> and so, and then it gets okay, Hugh. So I have to ask uh, after reading. Uh, your short story, uh, John, was it John, Paul, Xavier, and Ironside, but not uh, Vincent. Vincent. Uh, would that be the source of the name of the game Flipper Crutch? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> but it was Just from another, it was from another family member and i'm not sure if he stole it from a mad magazine or not but but uh my my older brother john who has uh, always been a gifted cartoonist was when we were kids was drawing this weird sort of it looked like half hockey half football uh, you know half ba baseball you know and, and basketball it was just this weird things and the guys had snorkels and they had weird hockey sticks and they had um, uh, little flip, uh, those little 
flippers you put on your feet when you're swimming, you know, scuba diving. <laughs> and so he would create these elaborate versions of this game called Flipper Crunch. Which, <laughs> but he might have, I've, I heard, I have heard that some people said there was something similar to that called, uh, with a similar name in a Mad Magazine uh, article in the 60s, but I don't know. But I, I've just always held it dear to my heart. It's a family memory. <laughs> No, Flipper came from her husband, who was, they're both English teachers, so <laughs> they're very embarrassed about forgetting words. One thing I would like to uh, like to bring up, if it's okay with everyone, it is possible that there are hidden benefits. Um, with myself, I find that I am forced to put my work under a microscope to edit for spelling. But while I'm doing that, I have to take each sentence out of context, out of the flow of the paragraph, and look at it and try to do, as Neil Gaiman said, make every word whole weight. And I think that because that is partially a coping mechanism and something necessary to put out something readable, but also because it forces that emphasis, it is a hidden compensa compensation because I don't think I'd put that a degree of emphasis on it if I wasn't so self-conscious about my writing. Uh, and you also catch factual errors when you're doing that. You know, like, uh, you're using steel and you're going through and you know, you know what, this is in the future. So it's not steel, it's polycarbonate and things like that. Mm. Uh, have you guys found hidden benefits? If you wanted to chime on this too, Nicole or anyone else uh, watching in, Feel free. Yeah, I, I said before that I think that my early struggles to be organized and to be coherent uh, have now made, you know, after 40 years of struggling with that, have now made me kind of really good at that. And I see that in my daughters too, when they're in middle school. Um, in fact, one of my best stories was my daughter from middle school came home and tried to tell me something so completely incoherent um, that I had to stop her and ask her questions. And that came the basis of the story um, I wrote. Um, but knowing that they had those problems and dealing with them explicitly meant now they both have uh, an innate sense of story structure and are particularly clear more than their classmates, I think, right? So in compensating for some of these things, again, the one you mentioned earlier, Stephen, I read at one fourth the normal speed. Uh, it turns out that's normal speed for editing, uh, which is useful to me. It's also, uh, as you say, I retain that material and understand it, I'd like to think at a deeper level than people. I had a friend who took a speed reading course, told me he had read a brilliant book. I think it was his Lasney book gave it to me to read, and uh, I plotted through it and thought it was nice, except I noticed, which he hadn't, is there had been an error in the book binding, and uh, every fourth page was out of order, and he'd read the whole book and had noticed it made zero sense, <laughs> or I, I caught it. So I, I think being slow is not necessarily a, a bad thing, Except for getting university courses where they assign you eight textbooks in one term. Yeah, that, that's a bit grim. Uh, but I remember uh, Samuel Delaney is also, in, in his autobiography, he mentions he's quite a slow reader. Uh, but uh, I, I certainly wouldn't characterize him as being illiterate by any means. No, he's the less lexic, though, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, uh, I, I think the one thing about that I learned that was... I, it forced me to realize that I was never going to be a one draft writer. <laughs> you know, that whole notion that, uh, that you can just sit down there and, and spew it out. No, it's going to go through at least three drafts. 
and just accept it. It's fine. Budget the time. You're never, you know, um, I, I'm never going to have L. Ron Hubbard's typewriter with a big roll into the into the machine that, that I type uh, usable copy uh, that quickly because it just ain't going to happen. So if uh, uh, Catherine, if you're looking for a, a franchise with nine volumes, I'm I, I would dial down to someone else on your list <laughs> than me. <laughs> But I actually think I'm a better writer for it, you know, to take mm -hmm. take more time. And uh, and it also makes it easier for a certain exercise. I studied creative writing. I had one instructor said, don't even think about what you're saying makes sense or is grammatically correct or the spellings aren't in your first draft. Just get the goddamn thing out of your system. Uh, go for a walk, leave it a day or two, come back and start rewriting it. And that's been very helpful advice to me, uh, both uh, artistically uh, and also, I think, uh, in terms of processing the, informa the information that's going into my brain and coming out. <laughs> yeah, well, Hemingway said, um, good writing is rewriting. Yeah. And I'm yeah, very much yeah. in favor of that quote. Yeah. The knack is when to know to stop rewriting, though, because you can. Oh, yeah. You can go right down a rabbit hole. But anyway, that's a whole other thing. I wanted to say that I think one of the advantages to having any kind of disability, especially an invisible disability, um, is that if you can be upfront about it, you enter into this whole world, this almost a secret world where you meet all these other people who go, well, since he mentioned it, actually, <laughs> and <laughs> there's, there's actually a ton of support out there if you're brave yeah. enough. Uh, there's there's always some people who do label you. It's particularly terrible, I think, when you're a child. But I, I have to say, I've been teaching for 25 years, and I find it's much easier to be upfront with my students. And then I lean into it. It's like, okay, so we're doing that thing. Remember that thing? And it's like this, and it has that. And, it's, and somebody says, and I go, yeah, that's it. Say it again. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and it, it makes a huge difference in the classroom. It makes it better. But it also makes conversations with people better. And it's a vulnerability I feel very comfortable sharing with people. And you don't always have those available to you when you're meeting people. But it's very the hard. I, when, sorry. Uh, that's okay. Yeah. You go for it. it happens with Zoom all the time. Uh, the one thing I would say is if you are going to be open about anything, that you really need to have armor plate like a battleship. Because while you do, you're right, there is this wonderful group of people who are, yeah, I'm like that too, or, oh, yeah, well, good for you. But there's the percentage of idiots, trolls, and they take delight in attacking anybody who they see as somewhat vulnerable. And uh, as I said, have armor like a battleship because that, you're going to face it. Yeah, well, that's one thing that, that is particularly devastating. And and I think we need to watch for it if we see someone else being shamed, you know, or given a hard time for this. Is And we got to speak up because I know personally, and I've seen it with other people, it's devastating if you're young, or even when you're not young, when someone in a position of authority, you know, or like your teacher or your, your doctor or something, it just says, you are lazy, uh, you know, and... Um, I think if you look in the sort of the history of the school systems, they actually, like the residential schools, they have their origins in the prison system. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and it's sort of like, you will conform. Uh, and there's still a, uh, and there's a lot of enlightenment. I mean, I remember when my boys hit school and they got into high school, I was really impressed with how much better the teachers were uh, than, you know, they were so a lot more flexible and harder working and more concerned about the, the, you know, what, what the kids were learning and, you know, what they were getting out of this and what sort of tools and skills and insights are going to have for future life. So that really cheered me up because a lot of my teachers didn't. They said they had a model. You got, you got evaluated according to that model. And if you didn't, that's it. You know, uh, we've got the Skinner box all set up. <laughs> we're going to put you in here. And if you don't get it right, no raisins for you. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> and, uh, you know, and I think, oh, that is the laziest form of education imaginable. Well, it's not even education. It's just really training you how to use the cash register at McDonald's. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, 
so we got to stick up for people. But uh, again, I keep thinking of, you know, uh, my mom was definitely not dyslexic, but I sure appreciated. My dad wasn't around, so I don't know what he would have done. But I certainly appreciated what she she put into helping me learn and, to, you know, helping me to learn how to learn. As did a lot of my professors. I mean, uh, I went as an undergraduate at the University of Lethbridge, has a really fantastic uh, uh, t uh, education program. And I think it sort of spilled over and a lot of the other departments and uh so uh yeah it was it helped yeah i was really fortunate to get in that kind of environment uh so um yeah and like a dyslexic i forgot my train of thought <laughs> i think colleen may have been uh waiting a little while to uh chime in here no okay not necessarily but it, well i didn't I wasn't waiting for, but since you mentioned it, I've been thinking about a piano student that I have who's seven, six or seven. And, um, and he's, I think he might be neurotypical in some way because he's, his parents are always trying to like stick him in a box and he, he's not like his older brother. And, mm -hmm. and, um, and he's, he's, he's really like, he's a young boy. So it's, it, he's, he's, normal that way in some ways but in other ways like he just doesn't fit in a box but he's fantastic at pattern recognition and 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 he doesn't love to stick to the page and and I haven't figured out and I haven't asked the parents if they would ever have him tested or something but but I kind of wonder like he when he listens to things he notices and and he comes up with things like like playing with two hands going opposite directions which is a fairly advanced skill but he just comes by it naturally so so it makes just listening to all of your conversation makes me wonder you know if if he he may have um some if if there may be something to what's going on in his little mind and body and uh so i'm happy to just follow him i told his parents that i wasn't i wasn't i'm not going to stick him in a box i'm not going to force him to do things the normal way and so, um, but just, it's very encouraging to hear all of you talk about, um, you know, just getting things out and, and I'd never heard about relating things like fatigue and memory uh, to, to dyslexia. So. And so, stress. stress. And stress. Is very, is very big. Yeah. Problem. Yeah. Cause it's interesting. Some of these things you, you, you hear them and you're like, well, you, you don't have to be neurotypical to, to feel those things. But there's a unique way of experiencing that stress, right? And experiencing that memory loss, it, how it channels through you, how it expresses itself. So this has really been helpful to me. Thank you, everyone. Well, uh, we're almost out of time. So uh, one quick round, and then I'm going to have to switch to the uh, spicy reading panel. <laughs> Those are the ones that you really like to read slowly, right? Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, I'll just my my bit is yes, dyslexia is a thing, but also deal with the person because mm -hmm. the worst thing you can do is turn your child into a label or turn mm -hmm. anybody into a label. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, you? Uh, don't be afraid to be creative in your solutions, you know, and realize that, that you can translate things into different forms uh, that you're more comfortable with. Um, and I, I, Colleen, I like your point about the box. I, mm -hmm. uh, I was so pleased when Candace Jane Dorsey wrote in the introduction to my second short story collection that Hugh Spencer doesn't just uh, right outside the box. He doesn't know there is a box. <laughs> and I thought, my God, Candace, you understand me. <laughs> and I felt so validated. So, you know, don't, you know, embrace it. Try to be creative with it and control it in that sense. Don't let it get the better of you. Uh, Robert? There's, there's a way forward. So. Uh, just that the selection covers a lot of territory. Uh, yeah. It's not just the reading, it's these other things. And if you see somebody who reads perfectly, they still may have dyslexia in the other parts. Or if they have, you know, uh, trouble mm -hmm. spelling, there may be other issues. 
So once you start looking into it, you can actually end up helping them a lot. Okay. Mm. Catherine? Uh, I just want to say thank you to everyone for sharing your experiences. Uh, it's been a particularly enlightening session for me to learn more and you know get another view at uh, how this affects your daily life. So thank you everybody for chiming in. Thank you, Stephen, for hosting it. Bye-bye. Bye, folks.